The poem Angle of Geese by N. Scott Momaday was first published in 1968. The poem is an example of post-symbolism. Post-symbolism is a style of writing which employs sharp sensory detail to deliver meaning. The occasion of the poem is the death of a friend's child. Momaday discusses the difficulty of conveying condolences and the inadequacy of language to convey his feelings at the funeral. The speaker's musings on death bring to mind another event, his killing of a goose while hunting as a boy. As the goose dies in his arms, it gazes at the rest of its flock, which has rearranged its formation and flown on. The poem is written in syllabic verse. The first and third lines have five syllables and, and fourth have seven. Let's see the summary of the poem. In the first stanza, Mamade discusses his feelings in attending the funeral of a friend's child. In particular, he refers to the difficulty of speaking directly to his friend about the tragedy. He is aware, aware of the deficiency of language in transmitting his feelings. He uses the verb adorn to indicate that language functions in this situation merely as decoration. Americans are given to oblique statements in expressing condolences, preferring to say I am sorry to hear sorry to hear about Jimmy rather than I am sorry your son died. In lines 3 and 4, Momaday uses a metaphor and then puns on it. He states that the presence of the dead child is like something pulled behind a boat in its wake, a wake also being a ceremony that follows a death. In the second stanza, Momaday continues his reflections on the inadequacy of language to express grief, but here he adds a new dimension, implicitly contrasting his Indian culture with mainstream American practices. In line 2, Momaday uses the word civil, meaning not only polite, but having also a connotation of civilized, as opposed to the savage practices of Indians. Plains Indians traditionally expressed grief more passionately than white Americans, keening the tremolo and practicing mutilation, cutting off hair or fingers. In lines 9 to 12, Momaday, along with other mourners, tries to come to grips with the death, assess its impact, but finds that he has difficulty finding the margin of repose, the beginnings of it. In the next stanza, Mamode shifts without transition to another event. As a teenager boy, he was hunting geese with a group of men by a river. As the geese rose from the water, the men fired all at once and one goose fell. Mamode picked it up and observed watching its fellows fly off towards the horizon. The bird died in his arms. This stanza describes watching the geese from a blind. Mamade uses the term huge ancestral goose to indicate its archetypal nature. It is no longer one goose only, but a symbol of untamed nature. nature. In the next stanza, the geese have risen, the men have shot, and one bird has fallen into the river. Mamaday remarks on the symmetry of the formation of geese as they fly off. He uses categorizes, a strained use of words or metaphor to describe the formation, the pale angle of time and eternity. Categorizes is traditionally used to call particular attention to something. Here it emphasizes the fact that there is something special about these geese, a transcendental dimension. In the final stanza, Mamaday makes use of what his mender, Ivor Winders, called a post-symbolist image, that is, an image in which the sensory detail contained in a poem or passage is of such a nature that the detail is charged with meaning without our being told of the meaning explicitly. Here the meaning seems to be that death is not something to be dreaded, but rather a means of escaping the trammels of time. The dying goose is already wide of time. Another categorizes is implying that while still alive, the goose has already entered another temporal dimension. 
The first stanza of Tangle of Geese presents a contradiction that has posed a problem for as long as human beings have used language to capture the natural world of our experiences. In the first half of the stanza, speech is an adornment of recognition, indicating that humans recognize or perceive an object or situation, and then after perception has already taken place, we attach words to it. In the last half of the stanza, though, the situation is reversed. Language leads the way and nature's most powerful reality, death, is experienced in the wake of language, not directly, affect, not directly affecting the person. The problem here is that understanding requires thinking about a thing, but thinking about it is different from experiencing it. This poem gives importance to the mute presence, identifying it as being more than language means. The relationship between language and reality is a concern of poetry, and for a poet to admit that language should be thought of as the less important of the two is in a way admitting the unimportance of poets. The second half of Angle of Geese gives us an example of how language can be used properly to project a situation without intellectualizing it and to show us what is happening without telling us what to think about it. We want to read more into the situation than the poem will allow us to do. There seems to be something symbolic about the huge ancestral goose. And yet there is something about a goose that allows us to form a known symbolic relationship. The last stanza especially confounds understanding. The dead goose lacks the context of ideas that it had previously belonged to. The description in the last stanza is designed to be interesting and accurate but not especially meaningful. Ang Angle of Keys uses death as a way to measure the ideas we hold about huge philosophical concepts such as language, time and geometry. We generally associate life with limitation and death with eternity. This poem, however, challenges that notion with the example of the goose. The goose. In the fifth stanza, the formation of geese flying in the air forms the pale angle of time and eternity, while in the following stanza, the goose that has died has been pushed outside of time's boundaries. If the usual assumption is that those who have died have somehow been launched out of our dimension into an eternal existence, Mamade reverses that assumption. Here life is actually the sphere of eternity, because eternity like language and symmetry is a figment of the human mind. The poem uses noticeably formal language, such as we take measure of the laws, laws in order to show how inappropriate language is in dealing with death's reality. While we use thoughts of eternity to comfort ourselves about death, we also use anger. Practically every death is an outrage and an injustice. By referring to the dead firstborn in the beginning of this poem, Mamade cleansed any lingering, misguided sense of unfairness. The first to be born is the first to die in the world of this poem. If the poem referred to the dead in any other way, it would be pointing out variations in this natural order instead of its consistency. By disarming us of the comfort of feeling that eternity awaits or of feeling cheated, this poem rips open the question of how we should respond to death. It opens with a question that is never answered. It is clear that the death mentioned has created a feeling in the poet, but Marmode cannot come up with an intellectual or verbal way to capture that feeling.